Good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Pallavi Priya and I welcome all of you to the first episode of HSI Prime Time on abdominal component separations of the third kind. I really, really thank Dr. Andrew for agreeing to be a part of the series and sharing his work with us. And Dr. Sunil Popat for graciously agreeing to host this program. Uh, I think most of our audience is already aware Hernia Society of India is the national chapter of the Asia-Pacific Hernia Society. And I'm proud to share that we have had about 20 educational programs and a three-day virtual national conference since the lockdown started. HSI Primetime is the most recent brain baby of the present HSI team and our president, Dr. Amesh Agrawala. The purpose of this program is to learn about pioneering developments in the field of hernia surgery from the pioneers themselves and also learn a little bit about their process. What drives people to innovate? How do they start? How do they go about accomplishing an extraordinary task? I would not take a lot of your time in introduction and hand over the stage or the screen to Dr. Sunil Popat soon. Dr. Popat is a GI minimal access and pediatric surgeon based in Ahmedabad, India, with over 26 years of experience. He is the vice president of the West Zone of Hernia Society of India and is the incoming president of Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endosurgeons. I have given him a difficult task introducing Dr. Andrew, a man that needs no introduction. So over to you, Dr. Popat, the screen is all yours. Thank you, Pallavi. At the outset, I would like to thank President HSI, Dr. Ramesh Agarwala and HSI executive body for inviting me to host uh, Mr. Andrew Debo, the legend in hernia surgery. Welcome, Andrew. I would like to introduce Mr. Andrew Debo. He is a consultant, general and upper GI surgeon at the Royal Infirmary Edinburgh since 2001. He has special interest in complex abdominal wall hernia repairs, laparoscopic upper GI surgery, including hernias and bariatric surgeries. Mr. Debo did his uh, Bachelor of Medicine from Edward Ebert in Scotland. He did FRCS from Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh. And he did Doctor of Medicine, MD from Edinburgh as well. He is past president of British Hernia Society. He is general secretary in European Hernia Society. He is also member of British Obesity and Metabolic Surgical Society, Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, World Society of Emergency Surgery. Dr. Andrew has so many accomplishments and has great interest in teaching. He also provides inpatient and daycare surgery, general surgery, elective and emergency, endoscopy and general surgery cover for the Lothian region in Scotland. He has special interest in the field of hernia surgery. He co convenes at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh a number of hands on training courses in open and laparoscopic hernia surgery. He was co-president of the European Hernia Society 2014 annual meeting held in Edinburgh in May 2014 and continues to serve on the International Scientific Committee for the annual EHS Congress. He is a regular member of faculty giving invited lectures at hernia and abdominal wall reconstruction conferences in Europe, America and Asia. He is past president of the British Hernia Society, organizing the biannual British Hernia Society meeting in Edinburgh in 2006 and 2018. He is also the general secretary of the European Hernia Society and co treasurer of the UEMS abdominal wall section. He is a member of the BGS Society Council, he is a proctor for CMR Surgical vs. Vers Robot. Mr. Debo is associate editor for the journal Obesity Surgery. He is also on the editorial board of the British Journal of Surgery, World Journal of Surgery, and our own Journal of Minimal Access Surgery. He has also published particularly on hernia surgery and authored numerous chapters on these and other surgical topics. Today, Mr. Debo is going to speak on 
component separation of third kind, which is a special technique which he and his colleagues have developed and pioneered for more than 10 years ago. He has published numerous publications on this particular topic and he has shown to the world that why this technique is important. There is no better person to tell about this technique than Andrew Debo himself. I welcome Mr. Andrew Debo to this platform of HSI Hernia Society of India, prime time. Welcome, Dr. Andrew. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's an absolute privilege to uh, be on this uh, session today. I do feel a real imposter as I don't consider myself a legend in anything, but I am very privileged to be asked to um, take part uh, in this session. These are my disclosures. I don't think they relate particularly to this talk. They just demonstrate that I do have uh, a surgery interest. And it's always a, a real pleasure to uh, speak to an Indian audience in particular. I have a huge uh, fascination with India. It uh, starts as my father was born and bred in India. This is his um, school report. This is him graduating uh, MBCHB from uh, Madras University, now Chennai University. Here's my father here in the lineup, and in this lineup, he's here. And for those of you that know uh, Chennai Medical College, will still recognize this building that's still standing. And this was his uh, medical registration certificate and his Punjab Medical Council certificate, which we found uh, recently uh, after his uh, death. And what's interesting, too, about uh, the old uh, style of uh, India and indeed the UK, uh, he went to university uh, uh, funded by uh, the army, but with the cessation of activities at the end of the Second World War in 1945, he was released from the army, uh, given a piece of paper to help him find a job. And this was his first um, um, a recommendation, in a sense, or reference from uh, Dr. S.K. Sen from Irwin Hospital in, in New Delhi. And some of you uh, may have heard of this gentleman and indeed uh, know the hospital. So with that background, indeed, uh, I married an Indian girl too. My wife's from India, uh, from Mumbai. So I have a very strong uh, fellow feeling uh, with India. But enough of introductions. Uh, component separation of a third kind. And before I set off, we have to be very careful that experts can be quite opinionated. I'm not sure I'm even an expert, but let's call myself a semi-expert. The problem is that our ideas are sticky. And when you produce a theory, we're not likely to change our minds. But I would like, to hopefully, to remain open to all techniques. But let me discuss uh, component separation of a third kind. And it's based, as so many operations now are, both at open surgery and minimally invasive surgery, on the retrorectus uh, space. And that's what we should call it. The recent uh, new classification of uh, mesh placement, we would call this retrorectus. And the term sublay is a word that we can um, perhaps leave aside. This talk is going to focus largely on technique, just to run through both a midline case and a, 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 a transverse or a lateral case. I'm going to talk a little bit about our results and results from uh, Sweden, which use a similar technique, but it's slightly different. And then I talk a little bit about the theory as to why a potential bridging technique may not be uh, a bridging technique uh, after all. Now, many of you will be familiar with both me lecturing this before and this uh, uh, original uh, um, description of the technique, but essentially this is a caricature of a midline incisional hernia. We're ignoring the skin here, but you do your laparotomy through the middle of the hernial sac. On one side, you're going to exploit the anterior rectus sheath, so keeping the hernial sac attached to the posterior rectus sheath, and on the other side, you're going to keep uh, the, the peritoneal or hernial sac attached to the anterior rectus sheath, which allows reconstruction with a degree of divarication, yes, uh, and we'll come on to the details uh, of that. Now, we called it the peritoneal flap, and I think that was a real mistake because most of us associate with of the peritoneum as a thin, very stretchy layer, which really has no uh, strength. And that's true in some cases, but here we can see quite a large incisional hernia. This was a case actually managed by a laparostomy that's eventually healed with skin grafting. But you can see at these marked points a very thick uh, uh, hernial sac. Yes, it's quite thin on this side. So when choosing which, which side are you going to use for the anterior rectus sheath reconstruction, I'd probably put this to the back 
and keep that at the front. But it's not herniosac, it's not peritoneum, it's quite strong. So we're going to run through this uh, poor gentleman's case. He's actually had a previous retrorectus repair, which made the dissection a little bit more difficult, but his pictures are quite nice. He had a, a road traffic accident, he had a clonic injury, he had a defunctioning stoma, multiple laparotomies uh, repaired, and you can see he has a significant abdominal wall defect. Now, we did Botox this gentleman. This is a recent uh, phenomenon from our point of view, but I've just put this slide in to say that pre-optimization is very important. I do work hard at getting people to lose weight. I do work hard at trying to help them uh, maximize diabetic control if they're diabetic to get the HB1C at least below 65. And then any technique uh, to try and increase intra-abdominal volume like Botox. We don't use progressive pneumoperitoneum, but that might be something that we uh, may embark on later. But preoperative peritonization is quite important. Having done all of that, when it actually comes to the day of surgery, the operation should be relatively straightforward. Just start off by simply excising the skin. Um, and what I do is I, I make a very simple excision uh, of, of the scar. Uh, we may excise more skin uh, later. Raise skin flaps back to what you see as healthy anterior rectus sheath. One of the downside of, of skin flaps is uh, devascularization of skin, but this is skin attached to the hernial sac. This is not skin that's onto the anterior rectus sheath where the perforators are. So this is a natural uh, cleavage plane because this skin didn't attach to the sac in the past. Having then excised the scar, laparotomy through the midline. The head end will always be up here or marked uh, with the arrow towards the head. Adhesio lysis as necessary to get it off the anterior abdominal wall. There's been multiple laparotomies here and you can see there's quite dense adhesio adhesions between bowel loops. I left those uh, alone. Deciding which flap goes up and which flap goes down depends on the quality of the flap. The flap here was of similar, uh, so this, the decision was made that uh, on this side, the flap would be at the back clear. So here we are getting in behind the rectus muscle and the retrorectus space, keeping the flap attached to the posterior uh, fascia. So now we've done that, and you can see we have a big flap, which already has a, a huge degree of uh, medialization, in fact, crosses uh, to the other side. Now turning to the... Uh, uh, other side, we're going to keep the flap attached to the anterior uh, rectus sheath, uh, and we're getting into the posterior rectus uh, plane here. A bit more sticky because this patient's already had a, a, a failed uh, retrorectus uh, repair already. But we've completed the dissection, and as you would expect, it's a fairly scrawny, not a particularly wide uh, flap on the back, but here we have the flap attached to the anterior sheath. Now it's a matter of closing um, uh, the posterior uh, rectus sheath hernial sac complex. Here's the medial edge of the PRS on one side. Here's the uh, cut uh, PRS on the other side. We don't use all of the flap. We use enough to get closure, but we would uh, not have it too loose. Otherwise, we would have a significant degree of the barrication. And here we are uh, bringing it together. At, at the bottom end of the wound, we've got PRS to PRS, the same at the top, PRS to PRS. But in the middle, we need a little bit of the hernial sac to bridge the gap, so to speak, uh, without uh, meshing on top. Uh, close, uh, anterior rectus sheath, uh, hernial sac, anterior rectus sheath. And this inked line down here just shows that we've taken about five centimeters of the hernial sac. There's no way this would come to that without tearing. And just by using a small amount, we have taken a large flap, made it into a smaller flap, but we have got uh, a closure. Here he is at the end, having sized a bit more skin. Now the old colostomy scars almost merged with the midline. And here he is two years later, a degree of uh, a stretching of the uh, scar, but you can see good definition of muscles, uh, lack of uh, the anterior bulge, and I would consider that a, a reasonable uh, result. A lot of people then say, well, what do we do when it comes to uh, lateral um, uh, uh, scars? Because that's a whole different ball game. Well, just a quick reminder of the anatomy. We have uh, uh, obviously um, the peritoneum, the transversus abdominis, the uh, internal oblique, and the external oblique. And they, uh, they separate quite nicely, except in here is the neurovascular plane between TA and IO. And then internal oblique forms a slip that comes down to form the PRS and a slip that goes up to join uh, and make the ARS uh, with external oblique. 
And so to make these two cavities meet, we have to obviously divide this little uh, slip. So the technique is exactly the same. You're keeping the flap attached to internal oblique and transversus on one side, uh, or, or above or below, and uh, the same external oblique has the flap attached um, anteriorly. Now, why do you use? Uh, why is it important to use internal and external oblique plane? Well, it's important, particularly in subcostal scars, which I will show you a, a case of. External oblique does not attach to the ribs. Internal oblique and transversus does, but it does allow you with scars close to the uh, costal margin to place the mesh over uh, uh, the costal margin, in a sense, underneath external oblique, over the chest wall, which gives you a few extra centimeters of coverage and less likely to have uh, recurrence. So here's a fairly uh, typical um, open cholecystectomy. Fortunately, we don't see too many open cholecystectomies, but this is an interesting uh, gentleman. He's interesting in the sense that he is a twin. He is an identical twin brother. Both of them in separate hospitals had laparoscopic cholecystectomies converted to open. Both of them got Staphylococcus aureus uh, wound infections, and both of them ended up with an incisional hernia, and I have actually fixed uh, both of them. Uh, so there is a suggestion that maybe in some patients, uh, incisional hernia is a re relates to their genetics and there's nothing to do with the surgeons. At least that's what I tell my patients when I get an incisional hernia. It's their fault, not uh, my fault. That's maybe being a little bit unkind. Same principles as the midline. Excise the scar. Don't get too carried away. You can see it's just excision. These are still the pop marks from the staples used to close it. So don't get too carried away with excising the scar to start with. Raise skin flaps back to healthy tissue, and here's the uh, sac here. Laparotomy through the middle of the sac, so this is a, a subcostal, so it'll be a, more of a transverse or an oblique wound. And then to get into that plane between internal and external oblique, keep cutting laterally until the planes start to appear. And here you're starting to see external, internal, and transverses. So we want to be in here. So keep going laterally, almost cutting new uh, beyond the old scar, till it opens up nicely. And you can see, yes, this is the right place. And now we can make a bit more dissection uh, laterally, and we're at the belly of internal oblique, and we're raising external oblique. How do you know if you're in the right plane and not between internal and transversus abdominis? Well, if you put your finger up here towards the head end, you will nicely slip over the, um, uh, the ribs. So you can only go over the ribs if you're between external and internal. Now this is a bit of a messy slide, so I'll go through it a bit slowly, but this is the, a fair bit of the dissection has been done and we're looking towards the feet. This is the right retrorectus plane. This is a plane between internal here and external oblique here. I think I was talking too much when I was doing this part of the operations. I've actually dug into uh, the internal oblique muscle. You shouldn't do that. You should be preserving the epimysium over the top as I have done here. And that then leaves us this bridge between the two cavities, which we need to cut uh, to take down. And here we have the flap attached to the posterior uh, layer here. So now we've divided that slip of internal oblique that comes up to form external, uh, the anterior rectus sheath. We've now created these uh, uh, two spaces into one. Yes, you will cut a few nerves here. But remember, these nerves have already been cut in the subcostal incision higher up. So uh, there's no further denervation going on at this point in time. The same thing at the top. So now we're looking at the head end. Here's external, uh, external oblique coming around here. That's internal oblique. This is retrorectus space uh, on the right, but on the head end. The sac this time attached to the anterior rectus sheath. And we have the same little slip of tissue that we have to divide to create here it is divided now to create this into one space. So now we have one space that runs around all the way here. The problem is that this, this uh, incision went all the way to the midline, so we have some difficulties of getting overlap medially and indeed across to the left side. But that's not that uh, tricky either. We've actually done the dissection. I'll zoom in and show you what dissection we do, but for many of you will be familiar with this dissection also. But you can see that the, the flap lying here virtually filling the space with no tension. And we have been able to utilize this sac. We won't take it all. Tension is important. You do need some tension. Uh, tissues respond to tension, uh, but you obviously don't want excessive tension such that your stitches will uh, cut out. So what do you do immediately? This is very similar to what's described laparoscopically in the tar-up and a bit what's done with uh, tar surgery. 
This is the um, uh, medial uh, uh, PRS that would come up to form the linear alba. This is now preperitoneal. And then we have divided the PRS as it comes up to form the linear alba on the contralateral side to get in behind the rectus muscle on the contralateral side. So we've got mesh that goes from the lateral edge of um, left rectus all the way over through the right rectus and then between internal and external oblique. And you can see that by having the flap here, this would struggle to meet this, but because there's the flap in between, it's lying there uh, loosely, even with a large pack in the abdomen, which would also take up volume. So we very quickly, um, in the interest of time, we've now closed the back layer. Now you can see that we have this big space from the behind the left rectus, behind the right rectus, between internal and external oblique laterally. So let's put a big piece of mesh in there. And this is a B bronze octane elastic, a mesh we've used for 12 years now, but it's, it's just a large, uh, large pore, medium weight polypropylene mesh. There's nothing fancy about it apart from the large pores. You can see they're about three to five millimeters uh, uh, in uh, diameter. The yellow arrow, that's the costal margin. So we can see we've got space above the costal margin because laterally the scar, which is the blue line, gets very close uh, to the rib margin. But going, going between internal and external oblique allows us to go above the ribs. Nice big uh, mesh uh, in there. And now we've closed the anterior rectus sheath, external oblique uh, uh, laterally, and the ink line, this is the suture line of the repair, and the ink line, that's the amount of uh, hernial sac that we need uh, to get uh, closure. Uh, you can say, well, why don't you just pull the stitches tighter and get that to that? But actually, this is under a fair bit of tension as it is. There's no way that this would make uh, there. And this is the gentleman uh, uh, three months afterwards, and I have regular emails from him to suggest that uh, he can used to do well, as does his uh, twin uh, brother. So that's a very fast run through of uh, the technique, um, but I guess, does it work? And um, we started doing this technique probably around 2005, 2006. Um, we weren't doing that many. We started doing it a bit by accident. Um, and um, we then decided that it was about time we published our uh, results. So uh, one of our visiting surgeons kindly looked at our patients over a five-year period. So there are 251 patients who had this technique, the peritoneal flap technique. And we chose to stop at the end of 2014 because the analysis was done in 2018 to give good follow-up. We didn't want to have patients who had an operation six months a year ago. So uh, two and a half years was the minimum follow-up and seven and a half years was the uh, uh, maximum follow-up at that time. And out of this group of 251 patients, uh, the majority were midline, as you'd expect, but a significant number were transverse. Some had had previous uh, repairs. And I guess what's key to this is why do we do so many open operations? Well, um, uh, three-fifths of them had significant abdominal plasty at the same time. So it's difficult to do a minimally invasive uh, operation and then do an abdominal plasty at the same time because the benefits of minim minimally invasive surgery is reducing uh, surgical site infections and occurrences. And therefore, to make a big uh, abdominal plasty scar and do it minimally invasive, for me, is uh, somewhat counterproductive. So abdominal plasty is a reason uh, to go uh, to open surgery. And these were our, our findings, again, with significant follow-up that six of 171 uh, failed and one of 80 transverse uh, scars failed. When you're dealing with large hernias, I think the, the median, um, I mean, the mean uh, width of the hernia was uh, nine and a half centimeters in this, uh, in this study. One mesh came out, uh, that would be expected uh, when you're doing uh, complex surgery with people with stomas, fistulas and what have you, you will lose some mesh. And the peritoneal flap doesn't fix everyone. And you can see it seems to work well with transverse. But nine of the 171 cases, we had to do some additional component uh, separation. Remember, this was before we started doing Botox. Since we started doing Botox, I'm not aware of adding in component separation since, but that's anecdotal. Um, but uh, you do need to have a few tricks up your sleeve. Now, it's easy to present your own results and say, well, um, uh, see, I told you so, but what about other people that have uh, utilized similar techniques? Around the time that we stumbled upon this technique, uh, shortly afterwards, uh, Dr. Montgomery and Dr. Peterson in Malmo in Sweden, um, uh, in a sense, invented technique also with a slight modification. 
And that's why they call it the modified peritoneal flap, because their technique is slightly different to ours in terms of how they suture the reconstruction, but uh, otherwise there's a lot of similarities. And they compared 96 patients that had a standard, what you would call sublay retrorectus reconstruction of anti-erectus sheath on one side to the anti-erectus sheath on the other side. And they compared it to a slightly uh, later, but a degree of overlap um, uh, uh, cohort of patients that had the modified peritoneal flap. Looking at them, they were similar mean width, slightly bigger in the modified peritoneal flap. It's interesting that those having concomitant GI surgery was higher in, in the modified peritoneal flap. And we know that both uh, concomitant GI surgery and the presence of a stoma increases your risk of surgical site infection and to a certain extent recurrence after uh, this sort of surgery. And in addition, uh, this group had a slightly higher comorbidity. They didn't, uh, they, this was a throwaway line in the paper. They didn't give numbers to it, but they said this group had higher comorbidity. So we're setting this group up to fail. They have a bigger hernias, they had more concomitant surgery, they had more, I sent clean contaminated uh, operations, and they were a slightly frailer group of patients. So this group shouldn't do well. And this is their results. Yes, the follow-up is slightly shorter for the modified peritoneal flap because they were a slightly later cohort, but short term, they seem to do the same. As part of the uh, Swedish Hernia Registry database, they do have a questionnaire that's sent out to them, an interesting patient satisfaction was higher in the modified peritoneal flap. But the key for me was recurrence. Remember, this was a slightly higher risk group, but yet they almost had an order of magnitude uh, reduction in recurrence rate compared to a standard retrorectus repair. So there must be something about this repair which enables a bridging repair, but doesn't behave like a bridging repair to produce a more reliable operation. And why is that? Well, I don't really have any science that I can tell you why it works, but I have a few theories that um, make sense, but like most theories, they need to be uh, proven. But is it possible that the flap allows a smaller reduction in the volume of the abdominal cavity at the time of repair? What do I mean by that? Well, I'm not very good at drawing, so apologies for my caricatures of an incisional hernia, but here's a fairly typical um, a midline incisional hernia. We've got the bulge of the hernia, and we've got a separation between the anti-erectus sheath medial ends on either side. And we're going to do a standard retrorectus repair. We're going to excise the sac, and we're going to bring together the abdominal wall at the end of the procedure. Now, many of you will tell me that there's no loss of domain here because all the abdominal contents lie within the walls of the um, abdominal wall. Well, I would put it to you that there's quite significant loss of domain here because when you bring this point to this point, and assuming there's not much uh, flexibility in the abdominal wall, you will have a smaller circumference. And a smaller circumference also means, in a sphere, a smaller volume. So whatever was in here has to be squashed into here under tension, putting strain on the tissues. And this hatch line is your relative loss of domain. Well, a lot is going to be said about the poor old uh, linea alba. And I have a few things to say about the linea alba too, and the anti erector sheath. The direction of the fibers on the anterior rectus sheath largely run horizontally. There is some interlocking, but as you know, it's a relatively flimsy interlocking. And we come to close the linea alba, but actually we're generally closing the anterior rectus sheath because after a laparotomy, the linea alba has usually been obliterated by the large bite, large stitch technique. And as you pull the stitches together, the stitches will tend to cut out because the line of fiber and strength is not there. We would want the fibers to be going this way at right angles to the suture uh, to give uh, strength. So there's some cutting out of the anterior rectus sheath. Now you could say, well, that could be stronger then in transverse wounds, and that's why transverse wounds have a lower incisional hernia rate. And that may be true, but if you put a lot of sutures through the same fiber line, then you will tear the fiber line and potentially have a weakness here and potentially have a weakness here. One of the techniques that uh, I use uh, in closing the anterior rectus sheath and hernial sac, and this is slightly a, a, an aside, but may have some science to it, but it uh, needs uh, uh, some more work too. I start at, at uh, one end, at uh, both ends, and I sew like this. And, and I sew like this, not pulling the sutures tight, and you saw it in the clinical pictures, all the sutures were in. I then ease uh, the tissues together, I tie my knot. Now, in a knot, this is a potential area of, uh, of weakness because the tying of the knot 
deforms the suture, making it more likely to snap. So your anterior rectus sheath repair could fail because you snapped the suture or because your knot fails. Also, when you're sewing it together to start with, you're trying to judge what sort of tension do you have. And you sometimes find that this bit at the top, for example, is a bit baggy. So I go through a second layer, I tie my knot, just a few throws, and I carry on using the suture, going back up and going back down uh, to the bottom, taking up the slack of any baggy areas. So that produces, in a sense, an inverted layer to start with and a second inverted layer over the top. And if there is some tearing of the knot through the tissue, these sutures will tear down towards here, interlock with these and stop um, uh, tearing of the tissues. Now you can say, well, that sounds uh, very theoretical, but it doesn't make much sense. Well, it does make much sense because if you look at the bottom of your T-shirt just now, you will probably find that you have two rows of sutures and you'll have a whipped end over the edge. And this is to stop the material fraying and it's to stop the material uh, falling apart. So industry have worked out that if you're going to sew T-shirts, that you need to have two layers of uh, suturing. And I just wonder, in the abdominal wall, uh, we need two layers of uh, suturing at all. I've also suggested that the flap might be stronger than native linea alba, and it is a very uh, tough piece of uh, material, often sometimes quite difficult to get the sutures through. And the final comment related to the orientation of the anterior rectus sheath and sutures cutting out in the hernial sac, because it's scar, the, fibre, the uh, bundles of collagen will be in a, in a random interlocking uh, manner. So even though this tissue might appear thinner, it's less likely to tear out because of the interlocking elements. A bit of theory, but how can we explain uh, the Swedish study that uh, with the standard retrorectus on smaller, uh, cleaner, um, fitter patients had a higher rate of failure than uh, um, the uh, uh, hernial sac uh, technique, which is thought to be a bridging through flimsy uh, tissue. Something must be working here that allows the body to reconstruct themselves uh, to a greater uh, state. It's often been called a bridging technique. Indeed, uh, some quite famous surgeons have suggested that we in Edinburgh have been making bridging um, uh, popular again which is a little bit unkind. We are good at making bridges in Edinburgh. We've been building a bridge across the stretch of water just to the north of Edinburgh every century for the last three centuries. So bridging is very much in our DNA. But I would put it to you that there is a, a misunderstanding of the linea alba and the anterior rectus sheath. This is a drawing taken from a well-known uh, surgical textbook. And this is how we draw the linea alba. Some massively thick, very strong, and even the anterior posterior rectus sheath are drawn as very strong tissue. This is just a, an everyday CT scan taken from a patient without a hernia, and you can hardly see the anterior rectus sheath and the linea alba. It's almost the emperor's clothes, ladies and gentlemen, that it's actually not there. And to put your repair on such a flimsy structure, I put it to you, uh, it's maybe the reason why even retrorectus uh, repairs uh, fail at 10, 20% at several years. And those results are simply not uh, good enough. And to say they are, we are kidding ourselves on. How does it look? This poor lady's had a gynecological uh, disaster. And this is her uh, post repair and abdominoplasty. So all the skin has gone. This is the Debeau sign. It works better for women than men, but the happier a woman is after her hernia repair uh, is proportional to how high she lifts her top above her nipple line. So if a patient is happy with her outcome, they'll lift their uh, top uh, very high. But joking apart, here's the same lady beforehand. You see a massive defect. There is some rectus muscle on the left. I can't see any rectus muscle on the right, but the, the, the fascial layers, ARS and PRS will be in there somewhere. And what we have done is restore, with a degree of bridging, yes, but this has been where the rectus muscle would have been. We have restored this uh, musculotendinous circle. We've taken it from the C, this is a C, with a gap here, back to the O. And this seems to be important for core stability to restore the O. Does it last a long time? As you know, it's very hard following up patients long term. They move away, they don't want to come back. But sometimes, uh, you have uh, lucky breaks. This is a gentleman I did 11 years ago now. Uh, he had Crohn's disease, multiple laparotomies. This is his umbilicus, and the last laparotomy didn't go too well. He was a very fit gentleman. He played semi-professional squash, uh, and uh, squash days were largely over at this point in time. This was him uh, a few months post-surgery. 
And you can see we managed to save his umbilicus. And this scar goes up onto his ribs uh, to try and take away the dog ear at the top. He returned uh, just uh, over a year ago now with his wife with gallstones. So his wife needed a cholecystectomy. But when he came with him, I said to him, do you mind if I have a look at your tummy just out of interest? And I took this photograph of him. This looks like a recurrence. Actually, this is a prominent uh, ziffy sternum because uh, the scar actually went over the top of his ziffy sternum. So 10 years later, this gentleman was back, back playing squash and still stressing his abdominal uh, wall. And once you master the technique, then you can start having fun. Uh, poor HBB disaster, massive lateral hernia. Here's the umbilicus uh, lateral hernia. Better weight loss, and we can get a reasonable restoration. You're never going to have perfect symmetry. There's going to be a degree of denervation bulge at the side as well from a scar of that side. But that's an acceptable uh, outcome. Uh, liver transplant, this is the scar, uh, uh, very popular in, in our hospital, and you tend to get failures here, but they can also fail out to the side and fail uh, at the top. And just a one slide from this operation, it's a bit messy, but we're looking at the back, heads up here, right sides out here. So we've got the PRS together here, we've got the PRS together here. But this is the medial side of the PRS from the left, or the medial side from the PRS of what's left on the right, and this is the hernial sac patch in a sense, filling that gap so that we have uh, a complete uh, inner circle and we have some uh, sac attached to the anterior rectus sheath up here. And there's the rectus muscle and then that's the slip in behind uh, external oblique that will allow us to get a big mesh in and close over the top. And we're in the process of publishing our results on 26 of these with no recurrences uh, to date. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope that I've made sense. It's been an absolute privilege to address you today. Uh, I feel honoured uh, by the privilege. As I say, I love my Indian uh, roots and Indian connections. And I appreciate that travel has been uh, difficult uh, in, in recent months. But we are hosting uh, the World Society of Emergency Surgery in Edinburgh in, in September. A warm invite to you all to attend. I look forward to seeing as many of you in person. And for those of you that uh, I haven't met before, uh, I wish you all the best. Stay safe and uh, keep safe for you and your families. Uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Andrew. It was a great lecture. Really enjoyed it. And you showed the master technique. And the difference we could see is uh, when a, a master himself was uh, develop the technique is teaching it. Uh, what, how did you come to the idea of doing this surgery? I mean, many a time we have used hernia sac uh, as a cover, you know, to uh, because these sheets are not reaching to the midline, we have used hernia seats. But how, how did it occur to you to use it as a flap? Well, we, we used to use it as a flap uh, early on. The, with the science of abdominal wall repair, it's a bit like the opposite of the keystone in an arch. So all the forces, obviously with the curve of abdominal wall, you have forces angled every which way. But as a vector, you turn them into one force and it's straight up against your repair. So getting the anterior rectus sheath together is, the, uh, is an important part of the integrity of a repair. So we were concerned if you ever had to bridge, and this was before we, uh, we really understood the traditional um, component separation techniques of anterior and posterior component separation. I used to keep both flaps attached to the anterior rectus sheath because I was terrified I wouldn't get anterior closure. It meant posterior layer closure was often impossible and you'd end up with a sandwich mesh technique. So you'd have a bit of mesh in helping bridge the posterior rectus sheath closure, your bigger mesh out to the lateral edges of the rectus muscle, and then you got the anterior layer together. And then it was from, from that, we said, well, why don't we, we often end up cutting away most of the uh, hernial sac uh, when we got the anterior layer closure. So let's cut out the, the, the mesh, the, the, the small mesh bridging, uh, the PRS. Let's try and see if we can use one flap to close the PRS and one flap to close the ARS. And it was develop it developed from that. Yeah, wonderful. Now your technique in midline is quite easy to understand, but in the lateral hernias, 
you are you are putting the mesh between the external oblique and internal oblique so yes. how do you cross the flap there in the lateral hernia repairs so it, well, usually what i do is as you saw from the slides i excise the scar i do my laparotomy and the the key bit getting behind the rectus sheath is for most people something they're quite familiar with who who do a retromuscular repair the difficult bit to understand is between external and internal oblique. So keep cutting laterally, and the planes just will tend to open up by themselves. You will see the, the, the EO-IO interface and the EO-TA uh, interface. And make sure that you stay in the external internal oblique. You then create your pocket, which, which you can do as far laterally as you can before you get to the um, uh, uh, quadratus uh, lumbar muscle and the, the back muscles. And then um, medially, you go behind the posterior rectus sheath, and that will then leave you that flimsy bit of tissue where external bleak comes up to meet the anterior rectus sheath, and you just have to divide that. And it's, it's a, a very flimsy uh, piece of material, uh, very similar to the technique of cutting the posterior rectus sheath as you head up towards behind the fatty triangle, behind the ziffy sternum. It's not much tissue, and that then creates your space between the two. Uh, it is something that's easier said than done. For me, a subcostal um, uh, repair is something I really enjoy doing now because it's a bit like a magician's trick. Having done it often enough, the layers come up quite quickly. And if I start to go wrong, I very quickly realize I'm in the wrong uh, space. Whereas in the early days, I had a fool for a teacher. I had myself to teach myself. And sometimes I would cut layers and realize afterwards I was in the completely wrong place. So like in most things in surgery, it's staying in the right plane. Yeah, perfect. Andrew, have you tried anterior component separation and posterior component separation? Uh, yes. So you will find, um, it, you know, the, per the perineal flap technique is our go-to operation. So that would be the thing that I would do with every case. So I would do my laparotomy through the middle of the sac. Sometimes you might make a decision to say, actually, you know, when you're talking 20, 25 centimeter width defects, you're thinking, I'm still going to have a problem closing the anterior rectus sheath. So I will keep more of the flap attached to the anterior rectus sheath than the posterior rectus sheath. But even with all those techniques, there'll be some patients that you, either the flap is really flimsy, sometimes that's the case. Sometimes uh, it has very poor vasculature, so you end up having to throw it in a bin. And sometimes if you're closing a open abdomen, so someone who's been treated by a laparostomy and you're doing a delayed primary closure of the laparostomy, you don't have a sac to deal with. So therefore you do need to use component uh, uh, separation techniques. And which one you do very much depends on what layer you've got to. Sometimes, for example, I've got the posterior rectus sheath together and I can't get, I thought I could get the anterior rectus sheath together with the sac, but actually I can't. Then I'd be doing an anterior component separation. If I'm realizing I've kept a lot of the, the, the hernial sac attached to the anterior rectus sheath and it's the back that's going to be a problem, then I would do a, a TAR uh, style uh, release. And particularly in men that have a very narrow costal margin uh, and, a, and virtually no muscle left there because their uh, scar went all the way up, particularly if you're looking at patients that may have also had a laparotomy and, for example, coronary artery bypass grafting, there is nothing left as you head up towards the top. Then you're going to need some extra tri tricks to get the back layer closed. And then uh, a TAR approach is probably the preferred uh, method. So you must know how to do component separations if you take these, take on these cases. But with a combination of Botox, weight loss, pre-optimization, the number of times that you will need to use additional component separation is quite small. We have a question from audience. How is the biomechanics different from bringing the recti to the midline? Do you expect the functionality to be different than midline reconstruction? Yeah, I was involved in a debate on this, which is quite interesting, because if you look at a lateral hernia, the midline is intact at the start of the operation because the patient didn't have surgery through the midline, yet they still have significant functionality uh, disorders to their abdominal wall. So clearly what's important is a midline, but also an intact um, 
What, when you have an incisional hernia, every time you cough, this happens. You've got a C. You need to restore the O so that there's a, a functional uh, integrity uh, to the abdominal wall. So there's been a lot of debate around um, functionality related to having an intact uh, midline. I think if you can get the midline intact, that is a goal that you should try and achieve. But it shouldn't be at the force of excess tension, and it shouldn't be, um, um, in my view, by cutting lots of other muscles if there's another way to do it. How do we test abdominal wall function? One of the commonest ways of doing that is in a machine which you do trunk curls. So you're sitting upright and you pull your, your you're doing uh, trunk curls. There's very little that we, that functionally, that we use that technique. Working your rectus muscles is good for your six pack, but unless you're dragging a train behind you, having strong rectus muscles are not important. Core strength comes from the lateral muscles. So the degree of divarication doesn't really matter. Now we say, well, divarication does matter. We see patients that have divarication, they do a sit up and they see a big bulge. These patients don't behave like that. If you ask them to do a sit-up, they don't bulge. They still have an, an intact uh, um, uh, 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 O to their abdominal wall. So it is uh, an interesting phenomenon. And then going back to the Swedish study, where they got the rectus, re rectus uh, where they got the, um, did a traditional sublay and closed anterior rectus sheath to anterior rectus sheath, they had a 10% recurrence rate. Where they had a degree of divarication using the modified peritoneal technique, they had a recurrence rate of 1.4%, almost 10 times better. So I can't give you the science because there's not a lot of science behind it. There is a, a, a scientist surgeon in Germany called um, Halinski that has been looking at um, abdominal wall repairs, and he's done some work looking at the peritoneal flap. And in terms of uh, strength against repetitive stress testing, and he has a measure called GRIP, um, it seems to behave very similar to a standard retrorectus repair. So I'm not too bothered about using a degree of divarication uh, because it seems to work. But I agree the science to prove why it's working is lacking. Yeah, thank you. We have another question from the audience that we have had difficult times separating the skin from the sac and we ended up with many holes at times. Is there a technical workaround to do that properly? Uh, it's, um, I use a lot of cutting diathermy to do it, and it's, it's, um, it's going back to plastic surgical technique. So I use this technique quite often when um, we still have a poor treatment of the open abdomen in the UK. It's something that we don't see a lot of, but yet I see a lot of them because they come to me for repair. So a lot of them are left to heal by um, primary uh, or secondary closure, with, with skin grafting over the top. So I'm using the peritoneal flap or hernial sac, and I'm actually de-epithelializing the sac. So I, there's actually very little uh, space uh, uh, between, between it, but I'm just taking off the epidermis. Uh, and yes, you do get some holes, but you often don't need all of the sac anyway. Um, and often the bit with lots of holes gets removed, but it's just taking time. I would recommend cutting diathermy. Uh, and I also would recommend the technique that I would do to start with in that when you're excising the scar, excise with the scar, do your mobilization laterally back to healthy tissue. And the last bit of that dissection is taking the scar, uh, the skin off the uh, hernial sac. And often just by following the flat planes up to it, then that you get and using a degree of, um, of tension. So you pick up the skin with a retractor, pull hard on it, and using cutting diathermy, you just find a semi-natural plane that you can separate it off. But you always have to be careful because bowel is not very far away. And sometimes you do lose a few centimeters right in the middle where the scar and sac are so adherent that it has to go in the bin. Yeah. Another question is, how much skin do we end up excising? Should the entire skin overlying the sac be excised? Since there is a fair bit of lateral dissection, do we not end up compromising the vascularity of the skin and subcutaneous tissue flap? Yeah. So uh, obviously you want to minimize uh, spaces. And there, there are two things that we do that uh, now change a, a little bit of what's going on. 
with a preoperative CT scan, you get an idea which is the stronger side of the flap. Now, maybe they're both the same, in which case it doesn't matter, but sometimes you'll see thicker tissue on one side than the other. The thicker one, I'll try and keep it attached to the anterior rectus sheath. In those situations, because some of the blood supply to the flap will be coming off the skin, I will actually minimize mobilization of the sac off the skin, and I will keep a lot of the skin adherent to the sac. And obviously, you can trim that back when it comes to the actual uh, uh, closure. Obviously, this, the sac that's going to be going to the posterior rectus sheath, you have to take the skin off it, but you're mobilizing that skin back towards uh, the healthy anterior rectus sheath, and obviously onto the anterior rectus sheath, but only by a centimeter or two. So you're not really dividing the perforators that were there uh, before you started, and, um, because there are very little perforators between the sac and the skin uh, where over the sac. So it's been careful not to raise too big a, a, a cavity. And remember, you're going to be bringing that together so you don't have such a big cavity uh, over the top. So be careful by raising skin flaps and try and minimize perforator injury. Yeah, in your series, I think you have reported few cases of uh, skin necrosis, and uh, because it's part of whenever you are treating and operating a very large hernia, by whatever method we do, there are chances that there may be some skin necrosis. Yeah, there is skin necrosis, and, and your population is probably similar to ours in that we are seeing more and more obesity. And um, there's no doubt that raising skin flaps in the obese, you're going to get more seromas, you're going to get more necrosis. If you look at the sort of people that plastic surgery tend to do abdominal plasties on, their BMI less than 30 and often uh, it, uh, smaller than that, whereas a lot of our patients will be 40, 50 BMI. So be very careful about uh, big skin flaps in large people. There, you're looking more at paniculectomy. You're, you're shelving the skin down, but you're not trying to raise a big skin flap off the uh, anterior rectus sheath. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, you published your results in 2014, and, and is there any follow-up coming up now? Um, yeah, so the technique was published in 2014. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the uh, midline cases were, were reported in, in 2019. The transverse um, paper was in hernia in 2020 and the transplant paper is in submission just now. Um, so we do try and keep updating. And the Malmo um, results were published in the Scandinavian Journal of Gastroenterology in 2020. Yeah. And this what we're looking forward to is actually, um, uh, I, I know there are a few centers in India that are doing um, a very active follow-up. Uh, Jignesh Gandhi from Mumbai is uh, one of the big... Uh, um, um, uh, uh, proponents of this technique, so they are having a big audit. I know uh, Shafaraz uh, in Calcutta has a reasonable series now and is auditing uh, his results. So I, it's very easy for me to give you our results. I'm very interested to know, well, how does it translate? You know? yeah. and, and do others get similar results? Because if others don't get similar results, then there's something wrong with our results. There's nothing special about what I can do. I'm a fairly average uh, surgeon, uh, but I do a lot of these. And I think that's the interest. Uh, if you have an interest in doing something, you will probably do it well. But there are some extremely talented uh, uh, surgeons in your country, and I'm really excited to see their results uh, when they come out. And I know uh, Jignesh is a big, uh, active proponent of this technique. Can this be done laparoscopy? Do you, uh, when do you decide that you will go for this technique and not laparoscopic ventral hernia? Yeah, that's a discussion uh, with the patient. Uh, and as you can see, 60% um, uh, of, of our patients had an abdominoplasty. So that's one of the issues that we have. We have a lot of large people, a lot of very ugly looking abdomens on top of their uh, uh, hernia. And so when I discuss laparoscopic versus uh, open, and then we discuss the potential for abdominoplasty, a lot of people switch off at that point and say, we want an open operation because we want a tummy tuck at the same time. If you're not a great believer in abdominoplasty, so that's not part of your practice, then there's less attraction to open surgery. Because there's no doubt that open surgery is associated with a significant wound morbidity rate. At least one in five of our patients will have a problem with some delayed healing, a bit of a seroma, a leakage, discharge. Uh, so it's not an operation without its comorbidity. 
Uh, again, size, um, but that's uh, laparoscopically, we don't have an, an upper limit, but uh, we have been uh, relatively um, anti-mesh in the abdominal cavity. So IPOM is something that we're not so keen on, except for smaller uh, hernias, and we've published a fair bit on recurrences on that. Uh, but certainly the new ETEP, and obviously uh, if you can get hands on a robot and do robotic TARS, there's no doubt that even in older patients uh, we're after robotic TARS, their, their length of stay in hospital, their time to recovery is truly phenomenal compared to an open technique. So there's no doubt the robot will help get older, frailer people with large hernias back up on their feet and out of hospital more quickly. Yeah. When we are talking about advantages of this uh, peritoneal flap hernial sac technique, one thing clearly comes to my mind considering working in India is the cost. I think if we can use the peritoneal flap technique, we can reduce the size of the mess as compared to the PCS with TAR. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I think in terms of the overall cost of the operation, the mesh is not particularly expensive. I use, as I say, um, a standard uh, large, poor, medium weight mesh, which in our hospital is 80 pounds uh, for a 30 by 30 mesh. And if you put it in on the diagonal, then its maximum can be 44 centimeters from the ziffy sternum to behind the pubes and then out to, uh, laterally. Yes, because the lateral edge of rectus is your boundary, you can't go any further. The mesh will be a little bit smaller than uh, uh, if you do a tar. But even a 50-50 mesh, I know uh, the Indian company Merrill does a 50 by 50 mesh. Um, um, it's not an expensive piece of mesh compared to a hospital stay uh, at that kind of thing. Uh, what it does do, I think, is it minimizes, it, it makes it a relatively easy operation. I think anterior component separation is relatively straightforward. Many people do struggle a bit doing a tar. They end up with lots of holes. It's quite a thin area. Um, and so they struggle uh, with that. And we also see um, hernias related to um, badly done anterior and posterior component separation techniques. So there is a morbidity associated with these other techniques where um, I, I think, I don't, don't like to say even an idiot could do my operation, uh, maybe I'm an idiot, but it's a relatively straightforward uh, thing to do. And so that's, a, that's one of the attractions. Yeah. We have another audience question, Andrew. How much intra-abdominal adhesiolysis is required? Do we need to take down all intra-abdominal adhesions as we do in a posterior component separation? I think, um, yeah, that's a balance. Sometimes the history will help you. Many patients who have recurrent bowel obstruction and mission to hospital are labeled or oh, they've got recurrent incisional hernia that causes their recurrent uh, subacute obstruction. I disagree with that because many of these hernias have uh, quite a large uh, neck. So it's a hernia is not causing the obstruction. It's adhesions that cause the obstruction. In that case, I would be more keen to do an extensive adhesiolysis, both off the anterior abdominal wall and um, off the um, interloop adhesions. But if there's no history like that, uh, then I do enough adhesiolysis that when I'm putting my posterior rectus sheath sutures in, I'm not going to hit bowel, but I'm not too fastidious by doing a lot of uh, adhesiolysis. Obviously, when you do a tar, the plane between transversus, the peritoneum and bowel is very small. I, I too feel more comfortable of having all those adhesions off the anterior abdominal wall. Because I'm not going out beyond the lateral edge of rectus, I'm less bothered about doing adhesions all the way out to the sides. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Andrew. You have covered very nicely almost all the aspects of this uh, wonderful technique of repairing large ventral hernias. Uh, we have Pallavi from Sarfra's team. I will ask Pallavi, Pallavi, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm here. Yeah. Can you share your experience with this technique? Uh, <clears throat> yes, honestly, I've done those many cases. We have done approximately seven, eight cases till now, and five of them with a component separation. Uh, but again, as Dr. Andrew said, he has been using Botox for a lot of his cases. We we are not using Botox that frequently for our cases. Yes, we have been able to achieve closure in all cases we have where we have used peritoneal flap. Uh, the follow up is still short. Uh, the shortest follow up we have is about seven months, 
and uh, these patients are doing well we have not had a recurrence till date in those seven patients and they are satisfied that uh, when we ask them to do setups the contour of their abdomen maintains nicely uh, it looks strong the repair looks strong on clinical examination we have not done any uh, dynamometric analysis on these patients yet we plan to do it uh but yeah clinically uh, we have had good experience with the technique till now thank you pallavi i will now invite president of hernia society uh, dr ramesh agarwala to join us ramesh yes thank you very much uh, thank you very much andrew for accepting our invitation and for excellent talk the more you we hear you the more fascinated we are and uh, there has been a very good audience participation you can see people are very interested in your technique in india and that's the reason they have so many queries and i'm sure over the time over, uh, over a period of time there are already a lot of people doing your technique but uh, they they may not be having the adequate numbers to come up with the results so in the next few years i'm sure we are going to have uh, quite a few uh, you know results or quite a few series from india on your technique and your technique is good we we actually feel it's very good but again as you said that it has to be backed by results from different centers and uh, the best part of your technique is you know it's easily doable you can replicate it i mean it doesn't mean that only you can do it anybody can do it so that's the best part any any technique which is re reproducible is definitely helps the average surgeon to do the technique so thank you once again andrew for accepting our invitation and for such an excellent talk sunil uh, my dear friend thank you very much it's always a pleasure and i wanted to start prime time with you as i promised and uh, we are very fortunate and blessed that you could take time off i know you had a webinar just before this with igs and you shifted your uh, lecture just to accommodate us thank you very much i am very obliged Okay. Pallavi, thank you very much for taking up uh, as the anchor for the show and organizing. She has put in all the efforts, and uh, she's she, Pallavi. You've done a great job, and Docsplexus always has been with us uh, throughout our programs. As Pallavi told you, told everybody that we've had a lot of programs during the pandemic, uh, which were very well attended, and it was always Docsplexus and Zoom. So, thank you very much. Good evening. good afternoon good evening and good night depending on where you are in which part of the globe and what is your time scale thank you very much thank you very much privilege thank you wish you all the best thank you, thank you.